4. 1 John chapter 4. Thanks for those of you that come out. Welcome any visitors that we have this morning. Trust you'll get a blessing from the Word of God. Encourage you to be back tonight at 6.15 for Bible study. Then at 7 o'clock for our evening service. It's always a good indication of the kind of days we live in in which you see a lot of people in church on Sunday morning and then not so many on Sunday night. And even fewer on Wednesday night. It speaks of and speaks to the kind of Christianity we have today uh, in the day in which we live. And we don't want to be those kind of people. We don't want to be once a weekers. Uh, we don't even want to be three time weekers. We want to be 24 hour a dayers. Amen. That's the kind of Christianity we believe in. First John chapter 4 this morning. First John 4. We'll read the entire chapter. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby ye know the spirit of truth. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the, that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that already should, it should come, that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. And knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in Him, and He in us, because He hath given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus, the Son of God, God dwelleth in Him, and He in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love Him because He first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment we have from Him, that he who loveth God, love his brother also. Father, we bow before You this morning and thank You for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful for a message to preach this morning. Lord, we pray that uh, uh, the, the sacrifice of our lips this morning, the praise that uh, came up from our lips during the song service, we pray that it was from the heart. Lord, we pray that we not do anything around here by ritual, by letter. Lord, we know the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Amen. Father, I pray that You'd stir some people up in here this morning to serve God with all their heart, their soul, and their mind. Not to serve the church, not to serve the pastor, but to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that this message might be preached and the power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit that it might sink deep into the hearts of the people that truth might be proclaimed today that the devil might not have his will in this service today. Father, don't give us just another dead service, Father. Give us one that's got life in it and truth and one that speaks to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To most people, the definitive chapter in the Bible on love is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And yet, that is not really true. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is not about love, but it's about charity. And charity and love are not the same. You say, how do you know? 
Because the words are different. Amen? Amen. Brother, 1 Corinthians 13 isn't about love. It's about charity. Now, you can have charity and not have love, but you can't have love without charity. You can do a lot of things in the name of charity and not really have love in your heart, but you can have, have real love of God in your heart and ha- not, not be without true charity. It'll be there. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is loved by a lot of sinners because nowhere in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is God ever mentioned. Do you ever find that out? You take 13, 1 Corinthians 13 out of the context and you have a chapter in the Bible in which God is nowhere mentioned in it. In fact, there's a lot of people think if you follow 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's like a road map to heaven or something. Nowhere in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 does it tell a sinner how to get saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is about the personal conduct and attitude of a blood-washed child of God. It never indicates that that is the way you justify yourself before a holy and righteous God. There are going to be a lot of self-righteous sinners that go to hell on the authority of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I'll guarantee you. That's very understandable why a lost man would confuse, be confused by 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The Bible says... He's lost, and he's a natural man, and he can't receive the truth. It's very natural that he confused 1 Corinthians chapter 13 with what it's really talking about. It's been well said many times that no man really knows what love is until he's been to Calvary. And I'll say amen to that. No man really knows where, what love is even about until he's been to Calvary and seen himself as a sinner and seen Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, dying for his wicked sins on the cross. No man really knows anything about love until he can see that really in his heart. In 1 John chapter 4, we have one of the most conclusive chapters in the Bible on the subject of love. In this chapter, we have love defined. The Bible says there, herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and gave His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. If you want to know what love is, that's what it is. Love is that God sent His Son to die on the cross for every pimp and dopehead and whoremonger and every wicked, jealous, vile person and every sin you've ever committed, every dirty thought you've had. God sent His Son to take the wrath of God on that sin. That's what love is. That's what love is. Hearing is love. Now I realize that that's not what the common definition of love is. But that's God's definition of it is. Love is not realizing that God is love you, or that, that you love God. I mean, love is not realizing that there's a God in heaven and all of a sudden you love Him. That's common sense. That's not love. Love is what Jesus Christ showed to you and me. Love is God loving us. That's the definition of love. According to 1 John 4, the foundation of love was laid 2,000 years ago on a cross outside of Calvary when Jesus Christ died for the sins of fallen man. Love revolves around a singular act, the atonement that God made through the Lord Jesus Christ. Without Calvary, love is absolutely impossible. Love is defined as an act. The crucifixion. The suffering of Jesus Christ. And not only that, it's personified in a person. We not only have love defined, but love personified. Over there in 1 John 4, in verse uh, 8, I believe it is, and in verse 16, it says, God is love. Now the world has turned that around to say that love is God. So that today man worships his own selfish, sexual concept of love. When you turn on the radio today and listen to an average station, 90% of the songs you are going to hear are going to be about that subject of love. And yet you're not really going to hear something about the love of God and about hearing His love. You're going to hear man's carnal, rotten, filthy, selfish view of what love is. The philosopher's solution to the world's problems today is what they call love. But what they don't understand is that love outside of Calvary is a worthless subject. You can't love man until you love God, and you can't love God until you've been to Calvary and seen what you really are. Impossible to really love without personal soul salvation. In this chapter, we not only have love defined and love personified, but we have love applied. It says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. The application of God's love in a saved sinner's life is that He loves others saved 
sinners. How badly we need that among God's people today. Jesus Christ said this, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. Putting up with one another. Bearing one another. Encouraging one another. Instead, most churches are kind of a gossip group that cuts down one another behind each other's back and gathers the little groups together and bites and devours one another. That's an abomination to the Lord Jesus Christ, that kind of behavior out of the sinner. Love applied is that you can apply the same love that God had for you to other sinners. Whether they wrong you, whether they pat you on the back, that you can say deep in your heart that you love another Christian. There ought to be no Christian in the world that you can't say deep in your heart that you do love him as a Christian. Now, there may be maybe people that have wronged you seriously as a Christian. But I'm going to tell you some if you've never gotten that thing straight with God to where you can say that honestly, deep in your heart, you love them as a Christian. You may not approve of what they've done. You may feel sorry for them because of what they got messed up in. But brother, if you can't say you love them, there's something wrong with your heart. You need to get it right today before you leave here. Love applied. Not only that, in this chapter we have love perfected. First John chapter 4 and verse 12, it says that God's love is perfected. In the fact that we love one another. And then in verse 417 it says, Our love is made perfect by us having boldness in the day of judgment. Because the love of God was shed abroad in our hearts, and because I'm saved by grace, I can say today that without a shadow of doubt, if I stand before God, I can say openly and boldly, God, you will let me into heaven because of the love of Jesus Christ He showed for me when He shed His blood for me. I've got boldness in the day of judgment. I'm not shaking in my boots this morning, hoping that this message will be good, just good, so it'll add another mark to my roadmap to heaven. Brother, in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, I'm already there. I'm not on my way, I'm already there. I'm seated this morning in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and I'm not waiting for eternal life. It beats within my breast this morning. Now, I've got boldness in the day of judgment because of the love of God. Amazing love. First John chapter 4 has more about love in it than probably any other chapter in the Bible. It's the de- definitive chapter in the Bible on love. And I'd like to think for a couple of moments this morning on the subject of amazing love. And when you realize it, the love of God is truly amazing when it comes to you and I. And I'd like to speak shortly on five things about His amazing love. Number one, His love is amazing when you consider that God and man are opposite in nature. Do you realize this morning that God's love for man is absolutely a contradiction in terms? It should not exist. God is holy. He ought to love things holy. He ought to love things pure. He ought to love things righteous. And yet He loves sinners. That's a contradiction in terms. Human love is often characterized by many things. Human love is characterized by common appearance. In other words, good-looking good people usually marry good-looking people. I realize there are exceptions to the rule, amen? Like Mike Roberts. I realize there are exceptions to the rule. But uh, good-looking people usually marry good-looking people, and then not-so-good-looking people usually marry not-so-good-looking people, you know. And uh, that's human love. That's, that's, that's the way people act, see. Uh, I love based on common interest. I mean, when you fall in love with somebody, there has to be something in common there. You can't always be arguing about what to do. There's some common interest shared between uh, people when they love each other. Not only that, there has to be some common philosophy, some common points of view. Not only that, there has to be a mutual, a mutual attraction. There has to be two involved that, uh, for, for, for real love to take place. That's what human love is about. And yet, when I look at the love God had for man, I don't see any of those things. I see nothing in the Word of God that tells me that God and man are alike. I see in the Bible that God is holy. I read in the Bible that man is sinful. I not only read in the Bible that man is sinful, I read in my own heart that I'm sinful. I read in my own heart that there's something in me that's wicked and vile and rotten that tends towards sin. Something in me that never got changed when I got saved. And that's that old wicked man that still abides there even now as I preach to you. I read in the Bible that God loves righteousness, and I read in the Bible that men love wickedness. Men love darkness because their deeds are evil. How do you get those two to come together? God should not love wickedness, and yet God loves the sinner, even though He's holy and righteous. 
The Bible says that God is interested in His Word. He says, I've magnified my Word above all thy name. And yet I read in the Bible that man doesn't care anything about the Word of God. As they said to Jeremiah, we'll not hear any more of this. As Stephen stood out there and told him what God said, they threw rocks on Stephen and said, shut up. Don't want to hear you. And yet God looks down on people and God, the Bible says God loves them. Not only that, I see from the Word of God that God has made provision for man. The Bible says that blessed be the God, uh, the Lord God Almighty, that daily loadeth us with benefits. The clothes you wear this morning are a gift from God. The food you ate before you came here, that White Castle hamburger you had before you came here this morning, that's a gift from God. Amen? All the onions on it and the holes in it and everything. God makes provision for man. But you know what I see? I see that man has no time for God. God makes provision for man. He says, I'll take care of him. I'll take care of his sin problem. I'll take care of his physical problem, his food. I'll give it to him. And yet when it comes to God, why, man, I haven't got any time. God doesn't make care. Man doesn't make any provision for God. I believe the psalmist understood that when he said, What is man that thou art mindful of him? I believe the psalmist understood the contradiction that exists when God loves a sinner, when he said, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Why, Lord? I believe Peter, Peter understood it in Luke chapter 5. Peter was out there fishing all night long. He hadn't caught any fish all night long. Can you imagine the kind of mood Peter was in when he fished all night and not caught anything? Here's a guy used to catching fish. I bet some of those old familiar phrases began to pop back in Peter's mind. The morning came, the Lord said, came out and said, Peter, I want you to put your net down on that side of the boat. Peter said, Lord, I've caught all night and caught a thing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I'll put it down. He puts the net down. I can't even draw it up. The boat begins to sink because all the fish in it. You know what Peter does? Does He falls down on his knees before God and he says, Oh God, depart from me for I'm a sinful man. Peter understood that very thing. He knew what he was like on the inside. The thoughts that went through that night of, of, of fishless fishing. That night of just out there all alone not catching anything. And the Lord comes by and Peter realizes what a sinner he is and how holy God is. And he says, Depart from me for I'm a sinful man. I believe Mary, the sister of Martha, understood that. But she anointed Jesus Christ with oil and then began to wipe His feet with her hair. I believe she understood the concept of God's love for a fallen mankind. I believe the centurion understood it when Jesus came to heal His Son and He said, Lord, don't come in here. You're not, you're, I'm not worthy to have you come in my house. Just say it from out there and she'll be healed. I know it. I believe he understood that. He said, Lord, you don't want to come in this place. I'm a sinner. I believe the Roman soldier understood it when he stood at the cross and saw Jesus Christ die. Had to watch that day at the cross and he said, certainly this was a righteous man. I believe they understand it. Mephibosheth, I believe he under, understood it in type. When he knelt before David and said, what is thy servant? That thou shouldst look upon such a dead dog as I am. Mephibosheth understood What a contradiction it was to have God love him. Is it not amazing that God could find anything about you to love? Undoubtedly, some of you in here are offended at that remark this morning. But if you ever got it straight in your heart, you'd find it amazing that God could even find anything in you to even count worthy of love. Amazing love when you consider that God's nature and our nature are totally opposite. Not only that, God's love is amazing when you consider our inability to return that love. Human love exists between two people specifically when that love is given on each part and returned. In other words, love cannot exist in strictly a one-way street. Love continually has to be given and received. And if it comes to the point where it's strictly given or strictly taken, then that thing becomes quickly turned into hate. Witness the recent events in which this lady, Jean, what's her name? I can't remember her last name. But she was just convicted of murdering that, that doctor who wrote the diet book. 
She loved him. She gave up her honor for him. He wouldn't marry her. She shamed herself so he so she could have his love. And he quit loving her. She never stopped loving him. But when the love quit being returned, that love soon turned to hate. You know, the love of God today is consistent whether it's rejected or whether it's received. God loves man when man is unable to return that love. You say, how in the world did God love me? What has God ever done for me? Well, number one, He died for you. Can you return that? What good would it do for you to die for God? God doesn't need any help. You dying for God wouldn't do a thing for God. Wouldn't make His day one bit sweeter or His eternity one bit longer. God died for you when you couldn't die for yourself and you're unable to return that love. Not only that, God loved you when He made heaven. God made heaven with all the glory and the splendor of it and the bliss of it with you in mind because He loved you. Now let me ask you, what can you make for God? Can you go home today and make something and say, look God, look what I made for you. I think there are some people that try. <laughs> I think there are some people that think they can really give God something, you know. You know, as David said, when he put out all that stuff for the temple, he said, Lord, we're only giving you what's yours anyway. But you know, some Christians, they act like, you know, it's theirs, and they'll give it to God, and God will say, oh, thank you. <laughs> what in the world could you make for God that would please Him? Not only that, God showed His love for you when He gave you daily provision. What's God need from you? Is God thirsty? Is He hungry? You know what He said in the Psalms? He said, if I was hungry or thirsty, I wouldn't ask you. <laughs> he said, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. What can you do for God? What? God doesn't need you. How in the world can you show God you love Him and return the things He, he did to you? Not only that, He shows you He loves you when He delivers you. When He gets you out of a tight spot. Let me, let me ask you, can you get God out of a jam? Can you come to God's rescue and say, God, here I am to save the day. Mighty Christian is on the way. You know, that kind of thing. Does God need you? God doesn't need you. What in the world? You know what's amazing when God, God loves you? When our inability to return the love of God? It's amazing. The astounding fact of the matter is that God loves man, but God doesn't need, need man. And yet, man needs God and doesn't love him. Isn't that amazing? God does not need man for five seconds, and yet He loves him. And yet man needs God. He can't live without Him, and yet He doesn't love him. Amazing love. One of the most humbling moments in your life is when you realize that love that God showed you and how pitifully helpless you are to return even the slightest bit of that love. There are some ways man can show his love for God. You say how? By obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. We can show God we love Him by doing what, what, doing what He says. Not only that, we can show Him by the praise of our lips. I just, I'll be so happy when we get to heaven, when you won't have to pry singing out of people, and pry testimonies out of people, and pry praise out of people. Bless God, there's going to be shouting and glory, brother. Brother, I'm going to tell you something. There are going to be people up there that love God. If you don't love Him now, you'll love Him then. And you'll be praising the Lord and you'll be saying glory to God. And there won't be another dead church service. And there won't be another reverend church service. And there won't be another dry church service, brother. There is going to be shouting and praising God in heaven in glory. Because there you'll love Him if you don't love Him now. You'll love Him up there. I guarantee you. You can show Him by praising Him. Public and private. You ever praise God in public? Or do you keep that kind of thing in the church house? You know, most of the folks that say, I believe that kind of thing you ought to keep in the church house, I find that when they come to the church house, they don't praise Him there either. <laughs> They're just as dead in church as they are on the street corner, see? Not only that, you can show God you love Him by submission to His will. Are you submitted to Him this morning? Is your heart the, the prayer of your heart, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do, go whatever you want me to go. Nothing between my soul and the saints. Could you say this morning, Lord, I'm not perfect, I'm a sinful man, but as God is my witness, I'll do anything you want me to do this morning. If there's somebody you've got to apologize to, I'll apologize to them. If there's somebody you want to give me some money to, I'll give some money to them. If there's somebody you want me to witness to, I'll witness to them. 
Can you say that? Can you show God that much love? We show God love by our attitude toward His Word. Have you ever sit down and thank God for the Bible? Has there ever something transpired in your heart, an open Bible, just you and Him alone, and said, God, I'm so thankful for this book? Has there ever been a tear flow out of your eye as you read the Word of God and realized His love for you and what He did for you? Has it ever happened? You could show God God's love in your heart and return some of that love by your burden for souls? Do you ever get upset that people are dying and going to hell without Christ? Do you ever get upset that you reach so very, very few people? Or maybe it doesn't even upset you to the point that you're even willing to do the smallest thing about it. Amazing love. Amazing love. Even these things that I just told you don't even make a dent in the love that God has showed to us. Not only that, His love is amazing when you consider the cost of that love. Usually one does not invest a great deal of money in something for which he expects little or no return. And yet that is what God did when He saved us on the cross of Calvary. The most expensive transaction that ever took place in all the world, in all of time, is when Jesus Christ paid for the sins of the whole world. You see, the cost of that thing was great because the task was large. How in the world could a man die for all the sins of mankind and satisfy the holy righteous requirements of a holy God? The task was large when Jesus Christ took those steps up to Calvary. Not only that, the price was unique. The only begotten Son. Peter wouldn't do. Paul wouldn't do. It had to be Jesus Christ to come and die for sinners. The cost was great. Not only that, the cost was amazing. Because, you see, man was not worth dying for. You know, if someone would kidnap your child today, if you were a loving father or mother, I believe you could say in your heart, you would give them the house, you would give them your car, you would give them every earthly possession you have to have that one child back safe and sound. That ransom would be worth it. For what is a car? And what's a house? And what's money compared to a human life? What is it? It's nothing. I mean, if, if, if a ransom was required of my son, if I had it, I, I pray to God I'd be willing to give it no matter what it is. If your son or daughter had to have an operation, and you say, well, it's so costly, we're going to have to mortgage the house, and you're going to have to sell your house and sell your car and Get, it, get rid of your savings account. You say, would it be worth it? Of course it would be worth it. To see a healthy child, even the, the chance of a healthy child, it would be worth it. But what is that? It's just money. That's all it is. It doesn't bring happiness. It's just money. Of course it would be worth it. But you know something? I cannot say within my heart that it was worth it for Jesus Christ to die for me. It wasn't worth it. I wasn't worth it. You weren't worth it. And yet God put the most costly thing in the world on the cross to die for something that wasn't worth dying for. Man. Sinful man is not worthy to be redeemed by a holy and righteous God. I believe Charles Wesley put it better than anybody when he wrote the song that said, Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Not only that, His love is amazing when you consider our inability and our unwillingness to receive that love. Not only do we have a difficult time in returning that love, we have a difficult time in even receiving it. Because in order to receive the love of God, there must be some hard attitudes that take place in our life. That pride has to be humbled in order to receive the love of God. We know that the Bible says, Search the Scripture, in you and me think you have eternal life. These are they which testify of me. And yet how often we leave this book sit and becomes the last priority of our day. It becomes the last thought in our heart. It's become the badge of a Baptist to put it under your arm and carry it to church. And yet we really don't seek it and seek Him. 
through the Word of God. Sometimes we're just not interested in God. And yet when God when we're not interested in God, I still find the Word of God tells us that God is interested in us. When Adam wasn't looking for God and wanted to get away from God, God said, Adam, I'm going to find you. Adam, where art thou? That's the love of God. When Adam wasn't interested in God, God was interested in Adam because He loved Adam. Not only that, I think as I close, one of the most amazing things about God's love is that it has been and it will be rejected by most people. The Bible says, Broad is the way. Broad is the gate. Wide is the gate. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. And few there be that find. I believe one of the most frustrating cries Jesus Christ ever had in His earthly ministry is listed in the book of John. And the Bible said He cried out, He said, And you will not come to Me that you might have life. I can't understand it all, but as I thought this week, I thought one of the most amazing thoughts, or one of the most amazing things that ever existed, is that when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, I wonder if it went through His mind as He took everybody's sin on Him. I wonder if it went through His mind that most people will never even get the benefit of this. Most people will take what I'm doing right now and just throw it away. Not worthy to be redeemed. Most people throw it away. And yet amazing love still exists. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Let's pray. Every head bowed this morning and every eye closed. I wonder this morning, have you ever experienced the amazing love of God in your life? I wonder this morning if you could say, Preacher, I may not be everything I am, I ought to be, but I know this, I've experienced the amazing love of God and that He died for my sins and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I'm saved today. If you can say that, would you lift your hand as a testimony right now and say, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. Alright, God bless you. Put your hand down. How about you this morning? Would you say, as far as I know, I've not experienced the amazing love that God has for me. And I want to. And as far as I know, I'm not saved today. I'm going to ask you to pray for me. If that's your prayer this morning, would you lift your hand? Would you say this morning, I'm lost and I need to be saved? I need to experience that amazing love of God. Okay, you can put your hand down. Young children, anybody else? Is there an adult here this morning that would say, I'm not saved and I need to be saved? And I've never experienced the amazing love of God in my life? How about you, Christian? Have you taken that love and neglected it and thrown it aside? Have you come to the place where you almost feel like you deserve it? Have you gotten proud in your standing with God? Maybe if you have, maybe you need to come this morning and get it right. If God so loved us, so we ought to love one another. We're not going to stand and sing this morning, but if you need to come, just step out of your seat right now and you come.
Some have come. Maybe you need to come this morning. Would you step out and come? Maybe your heart's grown cold. The love of God has just become an academic thing to you. It doesn't mean anything to you anymore. You need something real. At one time it was real and it's not real anymore. If you love God, would you come back tonight? And that wouldn't be enough. Would you come back and would you praise the Lord tonight? Would you sing the songs? Don't sing them to me. Don't sing them to your wife or your dad or your mom. Would you sing them to God? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Brother Tunison, you come.